I'd like to welcome all listeners back to the um, to the uh, third section of the fourth installment of the analysis of James Joyce's Ulysses by uh, John Ruane, that is me. Um, as I said before, I hail from the village of Munave, which is uh, approximately six miles from the town of Athenry in the county of Galway. In the west of Ireland, uh, the other counties in the west of Ireland would be County uh, Sligo, County Roscommon, County Mayo, County, L- County Leitrim. Uh, they were the counties that make up the west, ar- west uh, of Ireland. Um, and this recording is coming from the village of Munave. Um, as I said previously, um, Munave would be w- would be like a, m- a real medi- medieval village, uh, you know will be steeped in history, you know, going back hundreds, you know, if not thousands of years. Um, St. Patrick, this is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, St. Patrick stopped off in Munavay, uh, many t- on many occasions, um, as the folklore goes, uh, stopped off in Munavay, uh, in its history, and um, it's just uh, something about Munave. When you enter Munave, you can you can almost smell the history in the village. It's it's just steeped in uh, uh, old round towers, um, uh, old ruined castles down in the wood. Um, uh, the French's family uh, would be would have been the landlords going back uh, hundreds of years ago here. Uh, the whole of Munave has just got a very it's 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 a lot to see in Monave down in the woods and the rivers around Monave and it's there's so many hidden things that people haven't really discovered yet around the village of Monave here and um, it's a very historical place as also is Athen Rye which is six miles away it's a very historical place with you know old old ruined castles old ruined walls monasteries and all this, all this, all this area of County Galway is really steeped in in history and historical sites, um, like the village of Munave, Athenry Town, you know, Turlock Moor as well is another very would have a lot of you know old castles and old ruined mon- monasteries and and so on and so forth, um, rivers and whatnot, and of course Ebi- the village of Abenakmai too would be actually the village of Abenakmai, which is about f- four or five miles from Munave, would have been a big seat of learning uh come back for you know thousands of years in europe there was monasteries in ebenak my come back to the time of saint bernard for a lot of uh, a lot of children from all over europe would have been sent to ebenak my to uh, for their you know like kids to get educated there's a, there's a fantastic ruined monastery there in ebenak my that you can um, go and visit um as there is many other historical sites around ebenak my as well but um, chiefly nowadays, uh, Monave, uh, Abenak Mai, Athen Rye, and Turlock Moor will be very, very lively nightlife in all the in all the pubs around all these areas, uh, where the arts in Ireland here are very much prevalent. Uh, storytelling, um, Irish dancing, you know, uh, Kaley music, are also known as traditional Irish music, and all you know, most most bears. And you know, singing and you know what not, very lively spots of uh, County Galway, which you know a lot, a lot more tourists should, should really come to and discover from themselves. I know a lot of tourists go to uh, the main attractions, like you know, in a lot of places, different places where you know tourists are brought year after year. But I think really uh, people come and should go out to the uh, to these. Uh, towns and villages that are n- wouldn't be on the tourist maps as such and that's where you really find the real lifeblood of ireland as such you know um even all r- all this side of county galway is you have fantastic towns here like mount bellew um as well um mount bellew you'd have castle village of castle blakeney the village of caltra um my La, you know there's so many fantastic uh, villages and towns all in this area this are just very vibrant at the weekends and you know so many th- so many uh, ruins of old castles and what not to see like just waiting to be discovered which are re- not really on the touristy maps as such um they actually there should be a lot more i think you know but this is uh where you're you would see a, l- a lot of the real ireland um as such you know um well, anyways, before I just get to the book, um, 
I'm just gonna check the pages here now. As I said before, there's a raw, it's a raw uncut version. You know, it's, it's no uh, major operation here. It's just a, you know an ordinary, an ordi ordinary headset. And um, I'm gonna continue on now. We're up to an. I've marked here page, uh, page, um, page, page 81. I've marked here. Now, as I said before, it would be a good idea if people could mark uh, with a pen or pencil, you know, on the top left, right hand corner, whatever. Uh, I hope to get through five to s well, six pages possibly here at the sitting. Um, I'm so I'm at page, the beginning, uh, actually the beginning of page 81. And uh, um, just reading over the last few lines there. He clasped his hands between his knees and satisfied sent his vacant glances over their faces. And Mr. Power asked, how is the concert tour getting on Bloom? Excuse me. That's exactly where I finished now the last day, so I'm going to continue on reading. Um, oh, very well, Mr. Bloom said. I hear great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. Are you going yourself? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to the county clear on some private business. You see, the idea is to tour the chief towns. What you lose on one, you make up on, on the other. Uh, quite so, Merton Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. Have you got Artis? Um, Lewis Werner is touring her, Mr. Bloom said. Oh yes, we'll have all top nabbers, J.C. Dial and John McCormack, McCormack, I hope, and the best, in fact. And Madame, Mr. Power said, smiling, last but not least. Mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped him. Smith O'Brien, someone has laid a bunch of flowers there. Women must be her deathbed. Must be his deathbed, sorry. For many happy returns, the carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue united neithlessly their unresisting knees. Um, so I'm going to stop there and go over that. Um, and this actually, these six next five or six pages are not that difficult to understand. But there is, you know, there's a few little hidden things that, uh, you know, I kind of like to point out. Um, so I'll read over that. Uh, how is the concert tour getting on? Now, this is the concert tour that tour that uh, Leopold Bloom's wife, Molly Bloom, um, she's, you know, she's involved with a concert tour. She tours with an opera. I think she's a soprano. Um, she's a, you know, top, uh, you know, real top voice. So, you know, she's touring this tour, uh, concert tour. How is the concert tour getting on? Uh, Mr. Power asked Leopold Bloom this in the, in the, in the, in the carriage. Oh, very well, Mr. Bloom said. I hear great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. So he says, yes, this can on very well, this concert tour. I hear great accounts of it. So he hasn't seen it himself, but this is what he hears from his wife, obviously. It's a good idea, you see, he says. Are you going yourself? So Mr. Power probably asked that. Are you going yourself to it? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to the county clear on some private business. You see, you see, the idea is to tour the chief towns. This uh, concert uh, tours the chief towns. Um, what you lose on one, you make up on the other. So if you get a bear crowd on one, you make up on a bigger. You know. More people come, uh, you know, at a different venue, you know, so it all balances out more or less. Quite so, Merton Cunningham said. Quite so. That's an Irish, real Irish expression. Quite so. Yes, y that is correct. That's kind of what that means. Y quite so. That what that means here is, yes, that is correct. Quite so, Merton Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. So Mary Anderson is. She's probably a singer in in this, you know, this tour. She's possibly with the tour. Mary Anderson is up there now with them, I would say. So somebody else sa says, have you got, have you good artists? Have you got good, you know, artists in this, you know, tour? Um, this tour may not just be confined to, you know, the opera. There could be other things happening too on this tour, possibly. Next line. Lewis Werner is touring her, Mr. Bloom said. So, Mr. Bloom said, Lewis Werner is touring her. Now, he doesn't finish that sentence. He's about to say something else, but he doesn't say it. Lewis Werner is touring her whatever. And, you know, you just have to try and figure that out. Uh, but he doesn't finish that sentence. Lewis Werner is touring her, you know, whatever. Mr. Bloom said, she's... Uh, sh Lewis, this w Lewis Werner, 
uh, Werner is involved with this um, this concert tour as well it seems uh, Mr. Bloom said oh yes we'll have all now you see this is uh, this is excellent dialogue from Joyce here um, oh yes so y the sentence is not finished it's broken up and then he starts talking about something else oh yes we'll have all top numbers we'll have all top numbers top numbers means you know the best basically we'll have the best top numbers top people kind of JC Dial and John McCormack I hope there are two probably top numbers two top singers at that time JC Dial and John McCormack I hope and you see he doesn't finish sentence and the best in fact no that's that's the excellent uh, dialogue from uh, from Jice you know um, maybe Jice should have wrote more plays I know Jice wrote one play um, he should have probably wrote more plays because that's this that's great dialogue from Jice there um, next line and madame mr. power says smiling last but not least and madame mr. power says smiling that's great imagery from Jice there again and madame what he's more or less saying is and madame bloom meaning um, uh, Molly Bloom meaning uh, you know mr. Bloom's wife Molly Bloom and madame Bloom that's, that's what I was I was to guess here now I say and madame and madame and your wife he's more or less said mr. Parsons is smiling last but not least she's last but not least meaning that she's you know she's top-notch too last but not least mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped him you see uh, that's uh, brilliant how Joyce has described that Leo mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness so he's getting a little bit you know he's um, a little bit kind of is tense the right word to use here not tense he's a little bit kind of nervous he's you know because you know he's um, in a nice way like because you know his wife has got a huge compliment there um, mr. but that's you know that's just great the way Joyce described that mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped them now next line um, Smith or Brian someone has laid a bunch of flowers there now Smith or Brian now Leopold Bloom is looking out the window he is he's looking out the window Smith or Brian so he passes a house um, a house where a person called Smith or Brian lives someone has laid a bunch of flowers there so this Smith or Brian has died and outside this house somebody has laid a bunch of flowers there because he's dead and the kind of res respect here somebody dies you know I think happens throughout the world people come and lay a bunch of flowers outside the house Smith or Brian someone has laid a bunch of flowers there a woman a uh, woman laid the flowers there women are very thoughtful <laughs> woman must be his deathbed yes must be his deathbed you know must be his deathbed for many happy returns now Leopold Bloom is thinking this must be his deathbed for many happy returns um, you know, he's, he's thinking that just a bit of fun in his mind the carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue united noiselessly nice, their, unre their unresisting knees so the, the four people I was in the carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue a statue a stone statue uh, a person you know in uh, this statue is in, in homage to a person called Farrell wheeling by Farrell's statue united noiselessly their unresisting knees. That's great writing, Joyce. There, just visualize that. Uh, reading on. Hot, hot. A dull, garbled old man from the curbstone tendered his wares. His mouth opening. Hot. Four bo bootlaces for a penny. Wonder why he was struck off the rolls. Had his office in Hume Street, same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy, Crown Solicitor for Waterford. Has that silk hat ever since relics of old decency morning too terrible come down poor wretch kicked about like snuff at a wake or Callaghan or Callaghan on his last legs and madame 20 past 11 up mrs. Fleming is into clean doing her hair humming voglio e non really no really a none looking at the tips of her hair to see if they are split me tremor on Paco L um, not sure about that language but <laughs> whatever language that is um, beautiful on the tray her voice is weeping tone a trush a trussle 
There is a word trussle that expressed that. His eyes passed slightly over Mr. Power's good-looking face, greyish over the ears. Madame, smiling, I smile back. A smile goes a long way, only politeness, perhaps. Nice fellow. Uh, I'm going to stop there now and just go over that again now. Um, now that's just uh, small paragraphs there as such and there is, you know, there's a lot in that, you know, there's a lot of content in that from Joyce again, of course, again. Um, so, okay, going back. The carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue united noiselessly neither, their unresisting knees. Now you can just visualize their knees swaying and, the, you know, they kind of come together as such. Now, outside the carriage, there's a person in the street, um, and he says, O-O-T. Um, so, O-O-T, if you look that word up in the dictionary, you definitely would not find it. <laughs> As there is a lot of words in Ulysses that if you look up in the dictionary, you will not find. And I'm not even going to mention Finnegan's Wake, because I think every word in Finnegan's Wake, if you looked up in the dictionary, you wouldn't find the meaning. So, that's a misspelled word, of course. Well, deliberately misspelled. O T at so uh, try and pronounce that at 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 um at what I this person is saying is not saying at he's probably saying hot so he's probably saying hot a dull garbled old man from the curbstone curbstone tendered his wares his mouth opening hot um now that's what I think is going on now I'm not of course I'm not hundred percent sure. But there's an old man selling wares. He's selling something on, the, you know, and you see that a lot in Dublin. Even now in days in a part of Dublin there, you know, the you see a lot of people there selling, you know, apples and oranges and, you know, so on and so forth. And at that time, too, of course, they were doing that as well. Um, so he sent at a dull garbled old man from the curbstone tender his wares. He's selling something. His mouth opening hot. At. Okay, this is what he's selling. Four bootlaces for a penny. He's selling, you know, shoelaces. Four shoelaces for a penny. This is what he's selling. But he's saying at, at. He must mean, he could be saying, uh, uh, he has to be, or he could be saying they're, they're, you know, they're stolen. They're hot. They're hot. Uh, hot, hot. Or, you know, you know, that's what I think is going on there. Four bait bootlaces for a penny. So he's more than saying this is the reason they're so cheap because they were possibly stolen. And you know he's selling them off. Um, four bootlaces for a penny. So he's selling these bootlaces. Um, now Leopold Bloom starts thinking here, and he's he, he knows this person that's selling these bootlaces, and he's think he knows them, and he knows his life story or you know a certain amount of it. He says, "Wonder why he was stuck struck off the rolls, head an office in Hume Street." So this person selling these wares was struck off the rolls. He had an office in Hume Street. Same how it was the same house as Molly's namesake. Uh, same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy. So, I think we've already guessed or surmised whatever the word is uh, that Molly Bloom's surname was her father was called Tweedy. Now, we were kind of thinking, well, maybe Tweedy was a nickname for Molly Bloom's father, but Tweedy actually must be Molly Bloom's surname. So, same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy. So, this person selling these bootlacers, his surname is Tweedy. Crown solicitor for Waterford. Once upon a time, he was a crown solicitor, or a liar, as they say in America. He was a liar. He was a solicitor for, for a crown solicitor working for the government for Waterford. Right. Uh... Has now he's Leopold Bloom is still thinking, has that silk hat ever since? So, this person, uh, this solicitor person that's selling these bootlaces now, he still has that silk hat from the time he was a solicitor. Has that silk hat ever since? It relics of old decency. So, this is a relic of old decency when he was, you know, a solicitor and so on and so forth. Mourning, too. Now he's thinking, he's mourning, too. So, he's obviously this Tweedy. This <laughs> person, this is actually confusing to even try and uh, uh, try and explain this. Relics of old decency, of old decency, mourning too. When he says, when Leopold Bloom is is thinking, he's mourning too. He's dressed in a black suit. Then he's thinking, a terrible come down. Now, 
this is a terrible come down for for him because he once was you know a well-to-do solicitor working for the you know crown the government at that you know the government and a solicitor in Walford terrible come down now he's he's you know he's like a beggar in the street uh, selling shoelaces terrible come down poor wretch kicked up uh, kicked about like snuff at a wake so he's kicked about like snuff at a wake snuff is like I think snuff is something you uh, inhale it's like a peppermint mint thing that kind of clears your nose it's not illegal right um I think in the time that funerals you see them the, the you know it kind of clears your passageways that's all that is snow that's the snuff is kicked about like wake like snuff at a wake um or Callaghan on his last legs. Or Callaghan. So I think Leopold Bloom is thinking here. He reminds me of a person called O'Callaghan, O'Callaghan that he knows uh, on his last legs. He's on his last legs. He's about to die, basically. So there's just so much content there in four or five lines. So we went from a person selling four bootlaces for a penny, and then we got his Joyce gave us his life story, which is just fantastic. Now next line and madame so Leopold Bloom is still thinking about um, what the Merton Cunningham said and madame he's thinking about what he said and madame he, meaning his wife Molly Bloom 20 past 11 now he possibly looks at his watch it's 20 past 11 up he's thinking is my wife Molly Bloom up out of bed yet Mrs. Fleming is in to clean there's a woman called Mrs. Fleming comes in to clean their house and so on and so forth uh, Mrs. Fleming Mrs. Fleming is into clean today, and also doing her hair. Also, Ms. Mrs. Fleming uh, does, um, you know, cuts her styles. Uh, uh, Molly Bloom's hair, doing her hair, humming, humming. Now he's thinking about Molly Bloom. I think humming, Voglio e non vale, which is a song in an opera. I would say, no. He's thinking, no. She'd be humming a different song. She'd be humming Vare e non, and he's thinking. Molly Bloom will be looking at the tips of her hair to see if they are split. Um, That's what he's thinking. Um, women do that a lot, I think. They look at the tips of their hair to see if they split for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Me trimmer on Paco L. This is the uh, line from the song. Um, now he's thinking again. Beautiful on the tray, her vices. So he's thinking about Molly Bloom's vice. She, she's obviously a fantastic opera singer. And he's thinking, uh, she's beautiful on the tray, her vices. Weeping tone. Now I don't know much about operas or opera, operatic singing. I think Jai. I know. Yeah, I think Jai was was a big fan of operas, and he loved that type of singing. And he's thinking he was a great. Uh, Jai actually was a very good. Uh, uh, tenor he had, a, he had a fantastic tenor vice himself but he lo i think he loved all that you know and you can see it coming out in his writing here that he has a love for it you know beautiful on the tray her vice is weeping tone you see he, you can tell that Joyce really understands all this operatic stuff and uh, you know you can just tell his, his love is coming out here in the words you see beautiful on the tray her vice is weeping tone a trush he sounds like a trush which is a bird a trussel uh, I don't know what a trussel is, but it's something, you know, something beautiful anyways. There is a word trussel that expressed that. So the word, I should have looked that word up, but I didn't. I will actually. Uh, a trussel. So in Morrison, there is a word trussel that expressed that, would express our vice. Um, reading on. His eyes pass lightly over Mr. Power's good looking face, greyish over the years. Madame, smiling, I smile back, a smile goes a long way, excuse me, a smile goes a long way, only politeness perhaps, nice fellow, who knows, is that true about the woman he keeps, not pleasant for the wife, yet they say, who was it told me, there is no colonel, you would imagine that would get played out pretty quick, yes, it was Crofton, met him one evening, bringing her a pound of rum steak, what is this she was? Baramid in juries are the Myra, is was it? They passed under the huge uh, the huge cloaked liberator's form. Merton Cunningham nudged Mr Power. So I've gone over that again now there. Um Um there's actually so much in each page of <laughs> of Ulysses, it's just unbelievable, you know, it's not like a page of an ordinary book. There's so much content, even in any one page, it would be equal to like you know, 20 pages in most books, you know. Um, 
So, okay. His eyes passed lightly over Mr. Power's good-looking face. So Leopold Bloom is in the carriage and he, 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 his eyes pass over Mr. Power's good-looking face. Uh, Greyish over the years. So this Mr. Power's hair has gone grey. Now we know. Madame. Now he's thinking about one of the people in the carriage said Madame. He's thinking about the what, what they said Madame. Uh, Molly Bloom. Smiling. I smile back. So he possibly smiles at Mr. Power. Or Mr. Power probably smiles at him and he's, he smiles back. Uh, I'd be thinking along them lines. And then he's thinking a smile goes a long way. A smile goes a long way. And you know. And. A smile goes a long way in life, uh, every day, you know, so on and so forth. A smile goes a long way. Only politeness, perhaps. It's, yeah, it's polite. Nice fellow. You know, he's thinking about Mr. Power. Yeah, he's a nice fellow. He's a, you know, he's a nice person. He's sound, as they say in Ireland here. He's a sound person. Who know? Now he's thinking, who knows is that true about the woman he keeps? Now he's thinking about this um, Mr. Power. Who knows, is that true about the woman he keeps? So, there must be rumours that this Mr. Power keeps a woman. Who knows, is that true about the woman he keeps? Not pleasant for the wife. He's thinking this. Yet they say, yet they say, they say, you know, people, um, who was it told me? Now he's thinking, who was it told me that? This is what he's thinking. Um, there is no kernel. Um, Yet they say, who was it told me? There is no kernel. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. So, it seems like uh, this Mr. Power could be having, you know, possibly an affair. Uh, but man, it's hard to know either. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. Um, yet they say, who was it told me? There is no kernel. There is no kernel between Mr. Power and this woman. There is no, you know, they're not involved in sexual relations as such. You would imagine that would get played now. And he's thinking, well, if that's the case, that you would imagine this, you know, affair or friendship, whatever it is, would get played out pretty quick. It would finish pretty quick. Then he's thinking, yes, it was Crafton told me one evening bringing, or no, yes, it was Crafton met him one evening bringing her a pound of rumsteak, a rumsteak. So the person called Crafton met this Mr. Power bringing this lady a pound of rum steak. What is this she was? What is this she was? So he's thinking about the w this woman Mr. Power is seeing. What is this she was? Oh, she, and he's thinking, she was a barmaid in Jury's. Now Jury's is a hotel in Dublin. So she, w she, was a b she worked as a barmaid there. Or, w the Myra, or was she a barmaid in a place called the Myra? Was it? Maybe it's this Myra could be a hotel or something along them lines. Um, so now we're getting to know a bit about this Mr. Power. Um, they passed under the huge cloaked liberator's form. Now they have passed, this carriage has passed by a, a huge cloaked uh, liberator's form. They've pa passed by a huge stone statue of a person called the liberator. Now the liberator, um, the liberator was uh, Daniel O'Connell. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, if my remember, memory serves me correctly, uh, the Liberator uh, was Daniel O'Connell, was a huge figure in Irish history. Go back in the 1800s, and there's a huge statue of mine in Dublin. And his nickname was the Liberator. Uh, the passed on the huge cloaked Liberator's form. Now, Daniel O'Connell, he fought for rights for the Catholics in Ireland. You know, he fought for Catholic emanci emancipation and all that. Um, and you know rights for you know ordinary everyday you know uh, poor people at that time he fought for better rights for them you know I'm not sure about the right to vote but things along them lines he was for the good of you know ordinary everyday people especially Catholics um, so the liberator he was uh, Daniel O'Connell he was a huge figure in Irish history now if you ask me like 20 years ago I would be able to tell you a lot more because I learned all this in school uh, uh, but if you know nothing right nothing right tech uh, technical school I would have learned all that and um, so on and so forth and also uh, during my stint in um, in um, GMIT uh, which is the Goa Mayo Institute of Technology that I attended for a short while um, I learned all that stuff and I've just forgotten all that but that's so Daniel O'Connell or the liberator was it was Daniel O'Connell a huge fig figure in Irish history 
So they passed under his statue. They passed under the hedge, huge cloaked liberator's form. Mer Merton Cunningham nudged Mr. Power. So Merton Cunningham nudged a person called Mr. Power. I'm going to read it on here now. Um, of the tribe of Reuben, he said. Um, a tall black beard figure bent on a stick stumbling round the corner of Elvery's elephant house showed them a curved hand open on his spine. In all his pristine beauty, Mr. Power said, Mr. Dallas looked after the stumbling figure and said mildly, The devil break the hasp of your back. Mr. Power, collapsing in laughter, shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Grey's statue. We have all been there, Merton Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mr. Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, adding, well, nearly all of us. Mr. Bloom began to speak with sudden eagerness to his companions' faces. That's an awfully good one that's going the rounds about Reuben Jr. and the son. About the boatman, Mr. Power asked. Yes, isn't it awfully good? What is that, Mr. Dallas? Did Alice ask? I didn't hear it. There was a girl in the case, Mr. Bloom began, and he determined to send them off to the Isle of Man out of harm's way. But when they were both, what, Mr. Dallas asked, that confirmed bloody hobbly how, <laughs> is it? Um, yes, let me s we'll go back over that. So, the past under the huge cloaked liberator's form, Merton Cunningham nudged Mr. Power. Um, of the tribe of Reuben, he said. Now you would immediately think that he's that he's, he's comment on commenting on the statue of the liberator uh, Daniel o Daniel O'Connell, but he's actually not. It's he, the reason he nudged um, the region reason Martin Cunningham has nudged Mister Power is because he sees a person uh, in the distance. He sees the uh, the next line, a tall black bearded figure bent on a stick, stumbling round the corner of Elvery's elephant house show them a curved hand open on his spine that's great imagery from Joyce. so they see a tall one second my set of headphones just fell off there <laughs> definitely have to get a new pair um hint hint our councils in ireland um a tall black bearded figure bent on a stick stumbling around the corner of everybody's elephant house show them a curved hand open on his spine so there's a tall figure, he's bent on a stick, he's, you know, he's bent on a stick, so he's um, stumbling, is he stumbling around the corner, he's probably a little bit elderly, I would say, and he's probably stooped, uh, I would say, showed them a curved hand, but uh, this is what, uh, this makes this whole line intriguing, is he showed them a curved hand, so he's a, visualize his hand uh, on his back and it's open, showed them a curved hand open on his spine. Um, but of the tribe of Reuben, um, now of the tribe of Reuben, now we know, uh, you know, in the Jewish, in the in the in the in the uh, Old Testament, we have the twelve tribes of, of Israel, and one of them tribes will be called Reuben, I think, and um, of the tribe of Reuben. But that's not the Reuben that. Uh, this Mr. Cunningham is talking about. He's not talking about one of the, the, one of the twelve tribes of Israel, but he just mentions of the tribe of Reuben because uh, this person, this tall black beard, black bearded figure, his name is actually Reuben, but of the tribe of Reuben, he just mentioned that. But it's nothing to do with uh, uh, any of the twelve tribes from the Bible, or the Old Testament. Um. Um. Sure. Uh, reading on, in all his pristine beauty, Mr. Power si uh, said, um, um, "In all his pristine, pristine beauty, Mr. Power said." So obviously, the don't Mr. Power and Mr. Cunningham do not like this particular individual, whoever he is. Uh, we're going to find out in a minute. Uh, they don't like him. So they're, to they're talking like in a derogatory way about him. Um, uh, you can just tell by the tone of the language of the tribe of Reuben. Um, um, of the tribe of Reuben, uh, not that particular line, but just the way it's kind of said. Uh, uh, in all his pristine beauty, they're being sarcastic about this person. Uh, Mister De Dallas looked after the stumbling figure and said mildly, "The devil break the hasp of your back." <laughs> Mister looked after the stumbling figure and said, "My, the devil break the hasp of your back." Now that's the, 
I won't say that's a common expression here in Ireland, but you, I've often heard it in my lifetime. I've heard it a lot of times. The devil break the half of your back. It's kind of like you're cursing a person. It's like, oh, you know, to hell with you. You know, that's, uh, it kind of means uh, along them lines, like, oh, to hell with you. You know, I hate you, kind of, you know. The devil break the half of your back. You you know, you're, s you know, you're splagger, just so-and-so, you know. So they don't like this uh, Mr. Reuben. Whoever he is, you know, it's the devil break the half of your back. I hope your back breaks and you fall down, you know, die kind of, you know. That's what they were kind of saying there. Mr. Power collapsing in laughter shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. Mr. Power collapsing in laughter, so he's laughing. Shaded his face from the window. A great image from Jai. Shaded his face from the window. He didn't want anybody to see him laughing inside the carriage and, on, and they're on their way to, uh, you know, to bury a person. So he shaded his face from the window uh, while he was laughing. Shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. Passed Gray's statue. So it seems like they're passing another statue uh, of a person called Gray, I would say, possibly. Now, we have all, we have all been there, Merton Cunningham said broadly. We have all been there, Merton Cunningham said broadly. I'm not quite sure what that means. I have an idea, but I'm not going to say it because I'm not fully sure. Uh, well, you're never sure what Jice anyways, but um, we have all been there, Martin Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mr. Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, well, nearly all of us. So, we have all been there. Mr. Power collapsing and laughter shaded his face in the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. We have all been there, Martin Cunningham said broadly. Um, is he referring to uh, this uh, uh, black-bearded figure? You know, with the um, he stooped over, or, or I don't know. I, I just don't know about that. We have all been there. Mayor Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mister Bloom's eyes. So now he looks at Mister Bloom. He crests his beard, adding. So visualize him cresting his beard, and then he said, "Well, nearly all of us. We have all there been there, but." Mi Leopold Bloom has it. That's what he's more is, is saying there. But we don't know about what he's referring to yet. Mr. Bloom began to speak with sudden eagerness to his companion's faces. That's an awfully good one that's, do that's going the rounds about Reuben Jr. and his son. So this figure uh, that's been here uh, walking, walking about with a stick, his name is Reuben Jr. and he's a son. There's an awfully good one that's going the rounds about Reuben Jr. and the son. So this Reuben Jr., um, uh, he's the person, this tall black bearded figure, that's his name. That's why they refer to him of the tribe of Reuben. So there's an awfully good one that's going around about Ru Ru Reuben Jr. and the son. And so, about the boatman, Mr. Powerest, is this the story about the boatman? Yes, isn't it awfully good? Leopold Bloom's answers. Yes, this is the story about the boatman. What is that, Mr. Dallas asked. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear about the story. There was a girl in the case, Mr. Bloom began. There was a girl in the case. Uh, there was a girl pregnant, I would say. And the son possibly got this girl pregnant. There was a girl in the case. There was a girl pregnant, Mr. Bloom began. And he determined to send them off to the Isle of Man out of harm's way. And he determined, and the father of this uh, person. There was a girl in the case, Mr. Bloom began. And he determined, the father of the person that got this girl uh, pregnant, which is this Reuben Jr., and he determined to send him off to the Isle of Man. So he wanted to send his son off to the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man would be an island very close to Ireland. Uh, between Ireland and England, actually, it's called the Isle of Man. It would be a small island, and uh, probably a few thousand inhabitants. Could be a lot more now, you know, it's a beautiful island, the Isle of Man. And uh, So he wanted to send his son to the Isle of Man out of harm's way, until this, you know, blow or blew over this scandal that would have been at that time, it seems. Uh, and he determined to send them to the Isle of Man out of harm's way. But when they were bought, and he's cut off there, And but, but when they were bought, what, Mr. Dallas asked, that, that confirmed bloody hobbly how, meaning the son of this Roman, is it? Yes, Mr. Bloom said, they were both on the way to the boat, and he tried to drown. <laughs> and I'll, I'll read on the next paragraph. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, and they were both on the way to the boat, and he tried to drown, drown Barabbas, Mr. 
the Dallas cried, I wish to Christ he did. Mr. Power sinned a long laugh down his shaded nostrils. No, Mr. Bloom said, the son himself. Merton Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Rule, Reuben Jr. and the son were piking it down the quay next to the river on their way to the Isle of Man boat, and the young chiseler suddenly got loose and over the wall with him into the liffy. For God's sake, Mr. Dallas exclaimed in a fight, is he dead? Dead? Merton Cunningham cried. Not he. A boatman got a pole and fished him out by the slack of his breeches, and he was landed up on the father. He was landed up to the father on the quay, more dead than alive. Half the town was there. Mr. B yes, Mr. Bloom said, but the funny part is, and Reuben Jr. Merton come said, gave the boatman a florin for saving his son's life. Uh, reading over that again. Um, what, what, Mr. Dallas asked, that confirmed bloody hobbly how, which meaning this Reuben Jr.'s son, uh, that blackguard more or less. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, they were both on the way to the boat. The father, Mr. Reuben, the father and his son were on the way to the boat and he tried to drown and the father tried to drown. So, Mr. Dallas has, has you know, has put it in here in the conversation, Dr drown Barabbas. <laughs> which is, you know, Barabbas is from the Bible. Um, uh, you know, anyone that knows anything about the Bible, Barabbas was the person that, um, that drowned Barabbas, um, the freed Barabbas, uh, and, you know, crucified Jesus, basically. Barabbas, uh, so he just says, drown Barabbas, Mr. Dallas cried. I wish to Christ, he did. <laughs> I wish to Christ he did. Um, so more saying, I wish to Christ, I wish, um, I wish the father had drowned his son more or less. Mr. Power sent a long, a long laugh down his shade or nostrils. Great writing, Magister. there. So Mr. Power left. No, Mr. Bloom said the son himself. So this is the end of the sentence that he was saying previously. So, um, ooh, okay, let me re uh, the son himself. Um, okay, yes, Mr. Bloom said they were both on the way to the boat and he tried to drown the son himself. So the father tried to drown, was going to drown his son because of this scandal. Merton Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Uh, he, Merton Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Um, he, Merton Cunningham has kind of interfered now in this conversation and he said, he more or said, no, no, I think you've got that story wrong, Leopold Bloom. This is the real story. Reuben Jr. and the son were piking it down the quay, or down the quay next to the river. So they're walking down by the quay next to the river on the way to the Isle of Man boat. And the young chiseler, the young chiseler, young chiseler means young kind of blackguard. Um, uh, that's what ch chiseler means. And the young chiseler suddenly got loose. So the young son got loose from uh, from Reuben Jr., his father. Uh, he probably could have hold him by the neck or whatever. He got s he got loose. And over the wall, he jumped over a wall, and he he fell into the Liffey, which is <laughs> the main river in Dublin. So he fell into the water. For God's sake, Mister Dallas exclaimed, "The fate is he dead? Is he dead? He drowned? Dead?" Merton Cunningham cried, "Not he! A boatman got a pole, so a boatman got a pole and fished him out by the slack of his breeches, and he landed him up to the father on the quay, more dead than alive. Half the town was there, so he more or less saying he was saved." Which is kind of a bit ironic because the father was going to drown him anyways. But <laughs> yes, Mr. Bloom said. But the funny part is, um, and Reuben Jr. and Merton Cunningham said, gave the boatman a flowering for saving his son's life. So, uh, yes, Mr. Bloom said. But the funny part is, and Reuben Jr. and Merton Cunningham said, gave the boatman. So, Reuben Jr., the father, um, gave the boatman a flowering, which is kindage. You know, the equivalent of a pound for saving his son's life. So he didn't want him drowned at all. Um, as such, uh, a stifled sigh came from under Mr. Power's hand. Um, so that's just a little story there. Uh, so this uh, this uh, this Roman Junior is, you know, probably not a nice character. Um, it seems like is he? Um, he seems he could be a solicitor or something like that. Um, but he's not, he doesn't seem to be well liked anyway. Um, so reading on. Oh, he did, Merton Cunningham affirmed, like a hero, a, a silver florin. Isn't it awfully good, Mr. Bloom said eagerly. One and sixpence, one and eightpence too much, Mr. Dallas said dryly. Mr. Powers choked left, 
bust quietly in the carriage. Nelson's pillar. Eight plums a penny, eight for a penny. We had better look a little serious, Merton Cunning said. Mr. Dallas sighed, and then, and then indeed he said, and then indeed he said, poor little Petty wouldn't grudge you a left. Many a good one, he told himself. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said, wiping his wet, wet eye with his fingers. Poor Petty, a little thought a week ago when I saw him last, and he was in his usual health that I'd be driving after him like this. He's gone from us. As, de as decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Dallas said. He went very suddenly. Break down, Merton Cunning said. Heart. He tapped his chest sadly. Blazing face, red hot, too much John Barleycorn. Barley corn, cure for a red nose. Drink like the devil till it turns adelite. A lot of money he spent colouring it. <laughs> Great writing him joyous there. Uh, reading back. So a stifled sigh came cam from under Mr. Power's hand. Oh, he did, Merton Cunning affirmed, like a hero, a silver florin. So, let's continue on that funny story they were telling. Isn't it awfully good, Mr. Bloom said eagerly. Isn't it an awfully good, isn't it an awful, you know, funny story, kind of? One and eightpence too much, Mr. De Dallas said dryly. So, Mr. Dallas Morris said he gave him, he gave him, you know, he gave him a florin, he gave him more or less a pound for saving his son's life. He's more or less saying he gave him 99 cents too much. And uh, more or less saying the son is worth nothing, you know? <laughs> Mr. Powers choked left, burst quietly in the carriage. So Mr. Powers choked left. That's great, right, I'm just choked left. I visualize someone that wants to left, but you kind of you're trying to hold the left. He choked left, burst quietly in the carriage. So he's, he doesn't want to left because he's in a carriage and they're on the way to a cemetery to bury a person. And he's choked left, burst quietly in the carriage. Nelson's pillar. So Nelson's pillar. Nelson's pillar. Uh, Nelson's pillar. I know there's a big statue of. Uh, a person called Nelson, uh, which I think he was a British naval person, um, Nelson, and there was a huge pillar of him in Dublin. So they're passing that pillar now. It's a big, like, stone statue, Nelson's pillar. Um, so po possibly Leo Bloom is just thinking that, oh yeah, there's we're just passing Nelson's pillar now. So they're basically passing a statue. Eight plums. Eight plums a penny, eight for a penny. So this is another one. These street sellers, they're selling eight plums for a penny, uh, eight eight for a penny. Uh, like the boot, the, the person selling the boot laces, eight plums a penny, eight for a penny. This is some another street seller. We had better look a little serious, Merton Cunningham said. So Merton Cunningham said, we had better look a little serious. We're on our way to a funeral here, and we're after laughing at the carriage of this funny story. We had better look a little serious, Merton Cunning said. I, imagine, he's more to say, if Merton Cunning looks in and sees left and inside a carriage on our way to a, a cemetery, you know, it would look a bit strange. We had better look a little serious, Merton Cunning said. Mr. Dallas sighed. And then again he said, poor little Petty, wouldn't good as a left. Um, Mr. Dallas sighed, and, he, and then he said, and then again, poor little Petty, the person they're going to, uh, going to bury in the cemetery is Petty Dignam. And he's thinking, uh, and then again, he said, poor little Petty, poor little Petty Dignam, wouldn't grudge as a left. He wouldn't grudge as a left. Many a good one, he told himself. Many a good job, Petty Dignam, told himself. That's what he's more or saying. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said, wiping his wet eyes with his fingers. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said. So Mr. Power said, oh, the Lord forgive me. Uh, the Lord, Lord Jesus forgive me because, you know, for laughing here, but I don't really mean anything here, you know. Wiping his wet eyes with his fingers, wiping it, he's, he's, cause uh, that's great writing, Joyce, his wet eyes, uh, from the tears of laughter, basically. Um, wiping his wet eyes from his fingers, poor Petty, now he's, now he, he say, he's, this is all dialogue, he says, poor Petty, poor Petty Digna, poor Petty, I little thought a week ago when I saw him last, and he, and he was in his usual health that I'd be driving after him like that, he's gone from us. So he's lamenting his friend Paddy Dignam here. Next line. As decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Dallas said. He went very suddenly. <laughs> as decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Dallas said. He went very suddenly. Um, next line. Breakdown, Merton Cunningham said. Heart. So breakdown. He's, you know, he had a heart attack, I would say. Breakdown, Merton Cunningham said. Heart. He tapped his chest sadly. You know, you can visualize that. Next line, blazing face, red hot, too much John Barleycorn. Uh, 
so this Pelidine in the diet had a blazing face. He had a red hot face. His face was very red. Too much John Berlicon. John Berlicon is whiskey. So he's um, blazing face. Red hot. Too much John Berlicon. So this Pelidine drank too much whiskey. Too much John Berlicon whiskey. That's what he drank. Yeah. Cure for red nose. That's great right him, Joyce. Uh, too much whiskey would be cure for red nose. If you had a visualize, if you had a red new nose, and if you wanted a cure, if you want to get rid of your, <laughs> uh, this is the difference in, again between storytelling and great writing. Here, this is the perfect example. Of these three lines: blazing face, red hot, too much John Berlicon, cure for a red nose. If if a person had a red nose, if you wanted to cure your red nose drink plenty of whiskey because you would get rid of your red nose and the reason you get rid of your red nose is because your whole face would turn red that's what's going on here blazing hot red face too much john barleycorn cure for a red nose uh drinking plenty of whiskey is a cure for red nose because you get rid of your red nose because the rest of your face will turn red and you won't see the red nose anymore <laughs> i told you jace is a humorous writer drink like the devil drink like the devil till it turns at a light and this is great writing a lot of co a lot of money he spent coloring it <laughs> a lot of money he spent coloring his face uh, with all the whiskey he drank a lot of money he spent coloring it um that's just great writing Joyce all over mr power gazed at the passing houses with r rueful apprehension uh reading on he had he had a sudden death poor fellow he said the best debt, Mr. Bloom said. Their, uh, their wide open eyes looked at him. No suffering, he said. A moment and all is over. Like dying in sleep. No one spoke. Dead side of the street, this dull business by day. Land agents, temperance hotel, falconers, railway guide, civil service college, guilds, Catholic club, the industrious blind. Why, some reason, sun or wind, at night too. Chummies and Slavies, under the patronage of the late Father Matthew, foundation stone for Parnell, breakdown heart. White horses with white frontlet plumes came round the rotunda corner galloping. A tiny coffin flashed by in a hurry to bury. A mourning coach, unmarried, black for the married. Pieball for bachelors, done for a nun. Um, going over that again. Um, Mr. Power gazed at the passing horse. Oh, sorry. Mr. Power gazed at the passing houses with rueful apprehension. Now he says, he had a sudden death, poor fellow, he said. They're talk, still talking about Paddy Dignam. Um, the best death, Mr. Bloom said. It's the best death. A sudden death is the best death. Their eyes open. Their, their wide open eyes looked at him. So the other people in the carriage have looked at Mr. Bloom for some reason. We don't know wh why yet. Their wide open eyes looked at him. I looked up because of what he said there. Uh, we'll just bear that in mind. No, Leopold Bloom is still talking. No suffering, he said. A moment and all is over. There's no suffering. A moment and all is over. Like dying in sleep. No one spoke. Um, um, no one spoke. Possibly could be something here got to do with Leopold Bloom's father dying, if I was to guess at this moment in time here. Um now, dead side of the street is now Le Leopold Bloom right here has started thinking again. Now, and he's looking across the street and they're passing a street here and this is like a dead street. This side is, uh, you know, sometimes in the streets one side would be busy and the other side wouldn't be so busy. So he's thinking, the side he's looking at is a dead side of the street. Dead side of the street is dull business by day. There's not much business on this side of the street by day. There's land, a land agents temperance hotel this is what's on this side of the street falconers railway guide silver civil service college this is on this side of the street gills catholic club of course to the catholic club <laughs> jace is giving another dig to the catholic church here gills catholic club um um gills cat <laughs> he's, he's, he's constantly digging at the catholic church now um I'm also a Catholic, and actually, uh, I won't say I'm a staunch Catholic, but you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I definitely believe in God, and you know, I, I would be a proud uh, Catholic. So, um, there's a lot of things Jace is saying here that uh, <laughs> I don't like reading, it's but uh, it's, um, 
it's not that uh, it's not what Jai says. It's it's how he says it. You know, it's like um, you, you can't. Uh, you, I couldn't. You, you couldn't hold it against Jai for saying something, even saying something that you dislike. Uh, as long as he says it in a way that's just with great writing, you know. Um, so, um, he's, there's a lot in this book he says about the Catholic Church that I don't, you know, I don't like reading, but I just marvel at the way he says things, at the way he says it. It's not what he says, and I, sh I would never judge a uh, gentleman of what he, it doesn't matter what he says, but it's, what I'd be interested in is, is, is the skill the skill he uses in saying these things and that's what that's that's what, that's the way i would uh, look at it or and that's what most people should look at it. you should i don't you should look at what people are saying it's it's the skill of the writer in what he's saying so i'll just say a lot of things here about the catholic church that i don't like reading about and you know and priests in particular and so on for but i have to marvel at the skill he's using to say these things if you know it's hard to do describe what I'm trying to say but it's it's the skill of what he says uh, you know that's that's what I would marvel at um so back to the book here anyways do 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 I told you this is a real uncut version <laughs> um okay uh do do okay uh they were Gill's Catholic Club uh, this is on the dull side of the street by Jace of course the industry is blind why same r some reason sun or now sun or wind I, he's thinking is this dead side of the street is it is one is one of the reasons the dead side of the street because there's too much sun or too much wind on this side of the street and he's thinking at night too it's a dead side of the street there's chummies and slabbies all kinds of you know people coming here under the patronage of the late father Matthew. so now he's looking at a sign over a building under the patronage of father Matthew. So there's some charitable house here, and this is a, a sign that you see. They say foundation stone for Parnell. This could possibly be on this side of the street. I'm not sure. Now uh, he's not saying the geography about Parnell, because you know, James Joyce is a huge fan of uh, Charles Stuart Parnell. Um, I'm not sure about that there. Breakdown heart. So now he's thinking about what the people in the card were saying breakdown heart. Uh, he died of a heart attack. White horses with their white frontlet plumes came round the rotunda corner. So white horses with, you know, plumes of like, f you know, white feathers possibly on these horses came round the rotunda corner galloping. You can just visualize them galloping there. A tiny coffin flashed by. So there's a, ca there's a carriage here and there's a, there's a small coffin inside this carriage. You can possibly, it probably could be a glass uh, uh, maybe not a glass carriage. I wouldn't say there were glass carriages at that time. We wouldn't have many of them anyway. A tiny coffin flashed by. So, uh, maybe, oh yeah, maybe in the top of the carriage or whatnot. It's a tiny coffin. So it's a tiny coffin flashed by. It's just to, you can visualize that imagery clearly. White horses with white frontlet plumes came round the rotunda corner galloping. A tiny coffin flashed by. It went by, you know, quickly. In a hurry to bury. <laughs> in a hurry to in a hurry to bury this a morning coach a morning coach you know black obviously um uh so a tiny coffin is obviously a kid or someone uh, that died a morning coach uh unmarried um unmarried oh yeah well the kid would be unmarried obviously um i'm not sure if that what he means that that's meant there black for the married so now um I think Leopold Bloom is thinking here about the colour of the carriages, possibly, I don't know. Or coffins, maybe. Uh, the colour of the coffin. Black for the married. Uh, piebald for better. <laughs> piebald. Coffin could be coloured piebald. Black and white. Uh, it could be the carriages referring to here. Done for a nun. Done, uh, done is like, I think, done is the Gaelic language here, the Irish language. Done means brown, I think. Brown for a nun. That's what he's saying there. Uh, said Merton Cunningham said a child. Yes, so Merton Cunningham said sad. That's very sad. That's tiny cough from the flesh by. It's a child that died. That's sad. Reading on. A dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. Dwarf's body, weak as putty. In a white line deal box, burial friendly society pays. Penny a week for a sod of turf. Our little beggar baby meant nothing mistake of nature if it's healthy it's from the mother if not the man 
Better luck next time, poor little thing, Mr. Dalla said it's well out of it. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square. Rattle his bones over the stones, only a pauper nobody owns. In the midst of life, Martin Cunningham said. But the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his drew out his watch briskly, coughed and put it back. Uh, I'll go over that now, because I've turned the page here. Said, Martin Cunningham said, a child. So it was a child that passed by in that coffin. Um, um, a dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. So Leopold Bloom has started thinking his mind here again. And he's thinking, yes, a d that face of that kid would be like a dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. Now little Rudy is the son that Leopold Bloom had and he died at a young age. Remember? And wrinkled like little Rudy's was dwarf's body yes that would describe a young child like that. it's like a dwarf's body weak as putty in a white lined deal box in a white line a white little white coffin in a white lined deal box burial burial friendly society pays so it seemed uh, at that time uh, there was a charitable organization burial friendly society so you know maybe you know poor people's kids that would have died that as, as you know a, a society would have buried them Burial for friendly society would pay for the funeral i would say penny a week for a sod of turf so this is possibly how this organization would collect money a penny a week for a sod of turf um uh, they may collect a sod of turf from households or something along them lines this is how they collect their money possibly little bigger baby mint now this is a uh, little full stop bigger full stop baby full stop mint little bigger baby uh, not sure about that but it's something along all that line there he's thinking about mint nothing uh, that's possibly that young child that young coffin that passed by yeah Leopold Bloom could be thinking yeah a little a poor kid possibly mint nothing it would mint nothing um, he could be thinking along them lines you know nobody loved this child or something along them lines maybe Mistake of nature, um, to do. Now he's thinking about you know, you know, kids that might die, you know, like that at a young age. Mistake of nature, who knows? If it's healthy, it's from the mother. Now he's thinking, if a baby, if a baby in general is healthy, it's from the mother. If not, if it's not healthy, it's from the men. <laughs> Better look next time. So. He's thinking, you know, he's thinking all this like, oh, if a baby is healthy, oh, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's from the mother, because the mother's side. If it's, if it's, if it's not healthy, it's it's the men's side. Um, better look next time. Um, reading on. Poor little thing, Mister Dallas said, it's well out of it. Um, uh, Mister Dallas said, poor the poor little child that died, uh, it's well out of it. It's this is well off to be dead rather than living in, in, in the world at the time, possibly. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square, rattled his bones. Uh, so you can visualize that carriage uh, more slowly. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of... Now, visualize the horses, you know, going up a hill. Yes, they would move slowly. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square, rattled his bones. This is the body inside the carriage. Leo Bloom is thinking this, I would say, rattle his bones over the stones. So they're going over stones, probably possibly cobblestones. Rattle his bones over the stones, only a pauper nobody owns. Or he is probably thinking maybe it was a young child that died. Rattle his bones over the stones, only a pauper nobody owns. So this child young child that flashed by in the in the in the coffin was, you know, a pauper, poor poor child or something. Um, that's what's probably gone on there. In the midst of life, Martin Cunningham said. So, uh, you're talking about the young kid that died. He was in the midst of life. Reading on. The bu but the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his wa watch briskly, coughed and put it back. So, but the worst of all, Worse than that, he's uh, saying, the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Is somebody who commits suicide. Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed and put it back. So, uh, Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed. He, he drew his watch. He's, he's getting a bit apprehensive here for some reason. 
Um, I think we're going to find out a reel on this page. He took out his watch, he coughed, he, you know, he's, and he put it back. The greatest disgrace to have in the family, Mr. Power added. It's, you know, suicide is a disgrace in the family. This is what he's saying. Temporary insanity, of course, Martin Cunningham said decisively. We must take a chart of a view of it. So Martin Cunningham seems to get be getting a bit uneasy here with what with what uh, Mr. Power is saying. So um, temporary insanity, of course, Martin Cunningham said we must take a chart of a view of it. They say a man who does it is a coward, <laughs> Mr. Dennis. <laughs> so it looks like Martin Cunningham is trying to tell Mr. Power to you know be quiet, shut up for some reason here, and it kind of gets worse here. Uh, the same man who does it is a coward, Mr. Dallas, that um, someone who commits suicide. It is not for us to judge, Martin Cunningham said. No, he said, no, no, sh be quiet there. No, it's not for us to judge. Mr. Bloom, about to speak, closed his lips again. Martin Cunningham's large eyes, look, looking away now, sympathetic human being, he is intelligent, like, sh like Shakespeare's face. Always a good word to say, this, they have no mercy on, on that here, our infant side. Refuse Christian burial. They used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave, as if it wasn't broken already. Yet some things, yet sometimes they repent too late, found in the river bed, clutch, clutching rushes. He looked at me, and that awful drunkard of a wife of his, setting up house for her time after time, and then pawning the furniture on him every Saturday almost, Lin Leading him the life of the damned, wear the heart out of a stone, that Monday morning, start afresh, shoulder to the wheel. Lord, she must have looked a sight that night. The Dallas told me he was there. Drunk about the place and, and capering with Merton's umbrella, and they called me the jewel of Asia, of Asia the Jesua. Um, I was reading over that now again, here, and looking at the time also. Um... Uh, but the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed, and put it back. The greatest disgrace to have in the family, Mr. Power added. Temporary insanity, of course, Martin Cunningham said decisively, and we must take a charge of it. They say a man who does it is a coward, Mr. Dallas said. It is not for us to judge, Martin Cunningham said. Now, Mr. Bloom, about to speak, closed his lips again. So, Leo Bloom is about to say something here, but then he closes his lips. He's, he doesn't say anything. Merton Cunningham's large eyes looking away now. So Leopold Bloom has looked at Merton Cunningham's, you know, large eyes looking and he sees Merton Cunningham looking away. Merton Cunningham has looked away and Leopold Bloom is thinking here, he's a sympathetic human being, he is. And he's also, he's intelligent and Leopold Bloom is thinking, Merton Cunningham's, he's, a f he's got a face that looks like Shakespeare. Always a good word to say, and he's thinking, Marin Con Cunningham also is a good word to say about people. They have no, and then he's thinking, they have no mercy on that here, our infant side. Now he's thinking, people in Ireland uh, don't have any mercy on, on anybody that commits suicide, our infant side. Uh, refuse Christian burial. Um, I know at that time, if you committed suicide, you'd be refu refused a Christian bur burial in a graveyard. And now Leop Leopold Bloom is thinking, even further back in, in, in time or in history, they used to drive a stake of wood to throw his heart in the grave. Not just in Ireland, I'm sure, in other countries too, that if someone committed suicide, they used to drive a stake of wood to throw their heart in the grave as if it wasn't broken enough, as if the person that committed suicide, obviously their heart was broken for some reason, and he's saying, as if it wasn't broken, or wasn't broken already, you know, it's great writing on Jace. Uh, someone they would commit suicide, I'm sure there would be in a lot of pain, and obviously their heart would be broken. And he's <coughs> more than saying, and to do that to them, <coughs> excuse me, as if their as if it wasn't broken already, as if their heart wasn't broken already. Uh, now he's thinking, yet some t now yet people that commit suicide, yet sometimes they repent too late, they don't want to commit suicide too late. And he's thinking, sometimes found in the found in the riverbed clutching rushes so he's thinking or he's heard that some people you know that try to drown themselves they're found clutching rushes so at the last second they try to save themselves he looked at me 
Uh, so Leopold Bloom is thinking now, Merton Cunningham have looked back at him again. Um, and now he's thinking, and that awful drunkard of a wife is. Now Leopold Bloom is thinking, now Merton Cunningham's wife is a drunkard. And he's thinking about his wife, Merton Cunningham's wife. And that awful drunkard of a wife of his. So Merton Cunningham's wife is a drunkard. <coughs> setting up house for her time after time so he sets up house for her time after time and then pawning the furniture on him every saturday almost so every saturday she, she you know she sells you know the furniture in the house it seems leading him the life of the damned so Marilyn Cunningham's wife leads him the life of the damned she's an alcoholic wear the heart out of a stone that would this 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 we saying that would wear the heart of a stone wear the heart out of a stone that Monday morning, now he's thinking, Monday morning, every Monday morning he has to start afresh. Shoulder to the wheel, start all over again, more or less. Lord, she must have looked a sight. Lord, she must have looked a sight that night. Uh, Dallas told me he was, he, Dallas told me he was in there. So there was some occasion in the past where, um, Merton Cunningham's wife was, you know, drunk, locked, drunk, probably. Lord, she must have looked aside that night. The Dallas told me he was there. So Mr. Dallas must have seen his wife, and she was, you know, s she was drunk, very drunk. Um, Lord, she must have been, she must have looked aside that night. The Dallas told me he was there, drunk about, she was drunk about the place, and capering with Merton's umbrella. So she was really drunk, and she was she had Merton's umbrella and she was kind of playing with it and singing the song. So Mr. Dallas seen all this happening and he obviously told Leopold Bloom. And they call me the jewel of Asia. Or of Asia, the Jeja. <laughs> he looked away from me, he knows, rattled his bones. That afternoon of the inquest, the red label bottle on the table, the room in the hotel with hunting pictures, stuffy it was, sunlight through the slats of the Venetian blinds, the coroner's ears big and hairy, boots giving evidence. Thought he was asleep first, they say then saw yellow then saw like yellow streaks on his face had slipped down to the foot of the bed, verdict, overdose, death by misadventure, the letter from my son Leopold, no more pain, wake no more, nobody n nobody owns. The carriage rattles swiftly along Blessington Street over the stones. Uh even over that again. Now, there's a reason here that uh, in the previous paragraph, Merton Cunningham was trying to, you know, hush up uh, Mr. Power. Uh, and also, Mr. Dallas, when he said, uh, is only a coward that does it. But God, it seems like Leopold Bloom's father. Um, now, we read previously Leopold Bloom's father, he couldn't look at his face. and w You know, we were kind of, well, I was kind of thinking that it was maybe it was in an accident or... You know, and his face is, you know, disfigured or whatnot. But now we're kind of learning more about him, wh how he died here. Um, so, and they call me the jewel of Asia, of Asia, the Jeja. He looked away from me, he knows. So Leopold Bloom is thinking, Merton Cunningham has looked away from him. He knows, he knows exactly what happened to my father. And it looks like here that Leopold Bloom's father committed suicide. And, um you know after reading that next the next paragraph um so it looks like leopold Bloom's father committed suicide and that's why merton cunning was trying to shush up uh and was it mr power and mr dallas because he was more saying be quiet don't be talking about suicide do you not realize that leopold Bloom's father committed suicide this is what's going on here now when you if you actually read over that uh, previous paragraph again it makes a lot more sense um, he looked away from me, he knows. Leo Bloom is thinking, Merton Connolly looked away from me, he knows my father committed suicide. Rattle his bones. Um, now he's just thinking that line about, you know, the young kid that passed in the carriage, you know, and rattle his bones. That's all that is there. Now, Leo Bloom is thinking, that afternoon of the inquest, the red label bottle on the table, so the, you know, there was an inquest into his father's death, it seems, you know, the red label bottle on the table, the room in the hotel with hunting pictures. So he, uh, the room in the hotel with hunting pictures. So it looks like uh, Leopold Bloom's father committed suicide in this hotel. A red label bottle on the table. He committed suicide by drinking this possibly liquid or something from this bottle. The red label bottle on the table. 
the room in the, in the hotel with hunting pictures yes rooms in hotels do have hunting pictures that's great uh, preciseness from Jai's there the room in the hotel with hunting pictures stuffy it was it was stuffy sunlight through the slats of the venetian blinds you can clearly visualize there the the sunlight coming in through the slats of the venetian blinds just coming in like a little s uh, you know uh, venetian blinds it's not fully coming in it's coming in, in little spats you know through the slats of, of the venetian blinds the coroner's ears the coroner's ears big and hairy this is the person here at the at the stat boots given evidence so the, the person called boots his surname was boots he gave evidence of what happened possibly someone walked in the hotel um thought he was asleep first so leo Pablom is thinking i thought my father was asleep first when i saw him in the bed then saw like yellow streaks on his face then he saw yellow streaks on his face so he took some kind of a poison or something or an overdose or something and it ended up being yellow streaks on his face then saw ye like yellow streaks on his face which brings us back to the previous one we read previously how Leopold Bloom was thinking he couldn't look at his face so this is what he couldn't look at because he's seen these yellow streaks on his face then saw like yellow streaks on his face had slipped down to the foot of the bed foot of the bed foot of the bed here in Ireland they would say yeah they say the foot of the bed but it means it means the bottom of the bed where your foot would be <laughs> uh, had slipped down to the foot of the bed so his father had kind of slipped down to the bottom of the bed a little bit verdict overdose so the verdict of this kind of inquest overdose so he overdosed on some pills or poison whatever something along the lines death by misadventure this was you know he died by mis misadventure the letter so he left a letter from my son leopold so his father left a letter from my son leopold you know uh you know a letter he left him a letter no more pain wake no more nobody owns so he leopold Blum is thinking yeah no more pain for me wakes no more nobody owns uh, the carriage rattles swiftly along blessington street over the stones over the cobblestones um uh, reading out we are going the pace i think merton cunningham said god grant he doesn't have settled on the road mr power said i hope not merton cunningham said that will be a great race tomorrow in germany the gordon bennett yes by jove mr dallas said that will be worth seeing fit as they turned into berkeley street a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking rattling song of the hill of the halls has anybody here seen kelly k e w e y dead dead marriage from saul he is as bad as old antonio he left me on the on the o pirouette the mater missa whatever Eccles Street, my house down there, big place, ward for incurables there, very encouraging, Our Lady's Hospice for the Dying. Dead house, handy underneath, where old Mrs. Reardon died, they look terrible, the women, her feeding cup, and rubbing her mouth with a spoon. Then the screen round her head for her to die, nice young student that was dressed that bite that B, B gave me, he's gone over to the lying in hospital, they told me, from one stream to the other. Now, going over that again. And I'm coming up to finishing off this now. Here, this sitting. Uh, okay. The carriage rattles swiftly along Blessington Street over the stones, over the cobblestones. We are going the pace, I think, Merton Cunningham said. So Merton Cunningham said, yeah, we're going at a good pace now, you know. Brisk enough pace. We are going the pace, I think, Merton Cunningham said. God grant he doesn't have settled on the road, Mr. Power said. <laughs> so Mr. Power said, I hope... Uh, he doesn't upset on the road. I hope we don't all fall out of this carriage. He's going too fast, you know, or, you know, the coffin falls out or whatnot. God grant he doesn't upset us on the road. He's, you know, more saying he, he might be going too fast. I hope not, Merton Cunningham said. That will be a great race tomorrow in Germany, the Gordon Bennett. So now he has started talking about something else. There's a race on tomorrow in Germany, and it's called the Gordon Bennett. I don't know, is it a horse race or cycle race or some kind of race? But he says, I hope not, Merton said, that would be a great race tomorrow in Germany, the Gordon Bennett, uh, some kind of a race. Yes, by Jove, Mr. Dallas said, that would be worth seeing, fit, fit, like an Irish expression here, yeah, to say, yeah, fit, yeah, that would be worth seeing, fit. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. 
so there's some person on the street playing a street organ a street organ a street okay as they turned into berkeley street a street organ near the basin sent over and after they were rollicking so there's someone in the street playing a street organ you know and he's probably a hat on the ground and he's collecting money like you see a lot at the turn of the Berkeley street, a street organ um, near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. Has anybody here seen Kelly? This is the song he's singing. Um, now, what's coming to mind there is <laughs> Bob Dylan's song, uh, Hey Mr. Tambourine Man, you know? Uh, possibly did the idea come from here? We don't know. Oh, we never no, no. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking rattling of the song of the halls. Was um, was one of my favorite singers, Bob Dylan, influenced by reason reading these lines? We don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe Bob was. <laughs> well, uh, Bob Dylan, I'm, I, w I would be considered a Bob Dylan fanatic, uh, absolutely. Um, um, and I'm just thinking now, uh, Bob Dylan's famous, one of his famous songs, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man, is, mm, is you know, I did he get influenced by reading this? Possible. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. Now, this is the song this person is singing. Has anybody here seen Kelly? But this is good writing, great writing, Joyce, dear. Has anybody here seen Kelly? K E double L Y. If you if you say that out loud, listeners, K E double L Y, you see, see that it was all spelled perfectly. Dead March from Saul. Now Leopold Bloom, I start to think here, it sounds like the Dead March from Saul. He's as bad as old Anto Antonio. So Leopold Bloom is thinking here, this singer is as bad as old Antonio. Old Antonio was probably someone that played in some opera, and he was a useless singer probably. And this person is bad as old Antonio. He's He's just, he's a bad singer, basically. He left me on the Oneo Pirouette. The Mater, Miss, uh, whatever that is, Eccles Street. I uh, just thinking that, Eccles Street. So now they're probably passing Eccles Street. My house down there. Now Leopold was thinking, yeah, my house is down there. It's down that street, down, down, down that area. You can see in the distance. Big place. It's a big place for his houses. Big area, possibly. Ward for incurables there. So now they're passing a building, or you know, it you can see it. There's a ward for the incurables there. A ward, a hospital ward for the incurables. People are going to die. Very encouraging. <laughs> yes, yes. Our ladies' hospital hospice for the dying. So they're passing a kind of a ward and a hospital for our ladies' hospital for the dying. Dead house handy underneath. So he's so underneath is a dead house. You know, a funeral place probably. So the dead house, dead house. Handy underneath. It's handy to have a dead house underneath a hospice for the dying. That's what's going on there. Where old Mrs. Rear Reardon died. So an old woman called Mrs. Reardon died there. They look terrible, the women. So he's thinking w women in general before they die, they look terrible. That's what he's uh, thinking there. They look terrible. They look terrible, the women. Um, uh, you know, but they're dying of different diseases. He's more or saying the women look more terrible than men. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I think, you know. Uh, possibly her feeding cup and rub this is what Leopold Bloom is thinking now her feeding cup and rubbing her mouth with a spoon so when this old woman died she had a feeding cup and she was rubbing her mouth with a spoon um, you know probably could be some from dementia or something along them lines possibly then the screen round her bed f now then the screen round her bed for her to die so before she died they put a screen round her bed Nice young student that was dressed that bite the bee gave me. So once upon a time, Leopold Bloom got a got a sting from a bee, and the young student dressed it, you know, uh, at the hospital. He's gone over to the lying in hospital. They told me so. He's he heard that this student is gone over to the lying in hospital. So he's this student have been transferred to probably the hospice for the dying. He's lying in hospital because people have been lying in bed all uh, possibly all day. They told me from one extreme to the other. Ward is saying he kind of went from a hospital where they were living to a hospital, you know, a ward of the hospital where they're all going to die. That's pop possibly what's gone there. The carriage galloped, galloped round a corner. Uh, the carriage galloped round a corner. Stopped. What's wrong now? I'm going to stop right there now because uh, we're up to that kind of a time limit. And uh, let's see how many pages. We're up to actually page 85. Okay. Uh, we're getting there, listeners. We're getting there. We're getting there. No doubt about it. 
Um, now, where do we start at all? Okay, da -da -da, where do we start? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we nearly got six pages, five and three quarter pages, not bad. And we're up to page 85, and when we get up to page, another one, two, or possibly three sittings here to get up to page 100, uh, that will be a milestone, you know, in reading Ulysses, absolutely it is. Uh, 100 pages in Ulysses would be like the equivalent of reading, you know, uh, possibly a hundred other books, you know, yeah, basically. Uh, but I'm going to stop right there now. I'm going to sign off before I sign off. Uh, sign off from the village of Monavay here. Um, uh, that's it now. So, um, so um, I would like. Um <laughs> I don't want to give a plug to my book again. Nine stories, Mavenon. I'm not going to. I'm definitely not going to give any plug to my book, Nine Stories, Mavenon, which is actually. Um, not alone is a nine short stories, but it's also nine one act plays. And actually, I've done more research on the internet, and I've yet I haven't really I haven't come across a, a book ever, uh, you know, written in literature, where all nine stories are actually transferred, you know, using every word of dialogue in the book, you know, onto the stage as nine one act plays. You know, if any uh, listeners, you know, hear of a book that has ever been written, uh, please let me know. Um, and if not, uh, anyone that purchased that book, you will be purchasing uh, a totally unique uh, book uh, that's never been done in writing before. Um, I'm not trying to blow my trumpet <laughs> or anything like that, but uh, it is a unique book in the sense that all nine short stories are also nine one-act plays. And, you know, you've got the best of both worlds, uh, so to speak. And uh, as I said before, uh, people, you know, can, if you know stage actors and actors to want to rehearse new lines they can rehearse the lines exactly taken from the book you know just use the yellow marker to underline the lines you know one character you could underline yellow and the uh, the other character you know you know you know red or whatever you know, yeah you know different colors uh blue you know you can just highlight the lines for each character and because these are the lines exactly the w not so much as one word will be changed uh, these are exactly the words as as in in the, in that book and it is a unique book in that sense, absolutely it is. Um, I have never, you know, I, I haven't seen a book yet where all nine short stories were, were successfully, um, successfully will be played out on the stage. Um, and that's why I, I was bearing that in mind when I was r when I was actually writing that book as well. So, you know, I wanted to create parts for a lot of uh, stage actors and stage actresses out there. And it's, it's definitely done in that book. So anybody that purchased that book, I would really, really appreciate it. And also, uh, people could spread the word about that book. And the name of the book is Nine Stories from Avanon. And there should be a link to this, uh, a link from this uh, recording to it. And as I said, I am definitely not going to mention that book in this recording. <laughs> but, oh, uh, actually I have for some reason. But um, a bit of humor there. Uh, so, until the next uh next uh, recording on this and the fourth installment i will say goodbye and slancha and thank you for listening thank you <laughs>